couple of minutes and then Gina takes it away. We can start, Paolo. We can? Yes. All right. Well, uh, a, a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is Paolo von Schirach, and I have the privilege of serving as both uh, the president of the Global Policy Institute at Think Tank uh, in downtown Washington, D.C., uh, and I also serve as the chair of uh, political science and international relations at Bay Atlantic University, co-located. We're in the same building in downtown D.C., and we are very, very pleased to have the honor of hosting this uh, distinguished panel on a topic uh, that is really complicated and, uh, and the experts that we have here, I'm sure, will illustrate the various uh, angles uh, of this issue. Needless to say, we are living in a very difficult moment. Uh, COVID is still sadly around us. And until you know the medical geniuses that are working on this will give us a, a cure or a vaccine or both, we're still living under this cloud. But unfortunately, uh, beyond uh, the hardships, the economic hardships, which are felt mostly by low-income people, and that includes, uh, sadly, mostly minorities around the United States, we have to add the crisis that was uh, triggered by repeated instances of well-known police brutality, including, you know, needless and stupid, quite frankly, homicides that are perpetrated, it would appear almost for the fun of it, which is horrible. If you think about it, this is the United States of America and people are killed just like that. Um, it's terrible. And anyway, we've been reflecting these issues and, and you of all, you know, uh, among any people are extremely well aware of all this. But today it is our objective uh, to focus on another angle of this, uh, of this problem affecting African Americans and that is voter suppression. And I'll leave it to you, the experts, to really talk about it. But let me just say, as, a, as, a, as an observer, as an analyst, that our, this is what we've got in the United States, is the Constitution. And the Constitution is based on equal rights. And among the most sacred rights is the right to vote. And we know the sad story of uh, African Americans in the United States. You know, don't need to go through all the details. But suffice to say that even though slavery ended many, many years ago, racism hasn't ended, sadly. And uh, while you know, uh, laws were changed back in 1964 and 1965 with landmark new legislation, uh, attempts to restrict, limit, obstruct, whatever you want to say, the right of everybody to vote have crept up again. And this is the topic of today. But without further ado, let me turn it over to Gina, who will introduce the speakers and conduct today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Paulo. And once again, good afternoon. And thank everyone for joining. Um, so yes, good afternoon and welcome to the Global Policy Institute and Bay Atlantic University series, Beyond the Protest, where we have courageous conversations covering a multitude of topics related to the roots of racism, injustice, and inequality. Last week, we touched on police reform. Today, we will begin a discussion on voter suppression. I am Dr. Gina Rupert. I work at BAU. I'm uh, I create student success through career services initiatives, and I'm happy to serve as your moderator today. Uh, I did a little research just to put, uh, give some clarity and uh, historic context to our topic today. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 ended unconstitutional voting discrimination measures and restored the constitutional right for African Americans to vote. Sadly, in recent years, we've witnessed increased levels of voter suppression efforts, and currently voting rights are still under attack. There has been a great rise in voter suppression tactics and barriers across the country, most notably seen in Georgia's 2020 primary election where voters stood in line for up to six hours, experienced last minute location changes, and had problems with faulty polling machines. Tactics like these have primarily impacted low income and African American voters at a staggering rate. It is paramount that we discuss and continue to shed light on this phenomenon and fight it until all Americans, regardless of race, will be able to fully enjoy all their constitutional rights. As important reforms are being discussed at the federal and state level, the rights of all U.S. citizens to participate in elections, cast their votes, and have their voices heard must be guaranteed. 
To discuss today's topic, GPI and BAU have assembled an excellent group of experts. Today, my guests include Marlena D. Edwards, MSW, a community activist who recently ran for Ward 4 DC uh, City Council. Joe Scott, Supervisor of Elections, candidate for Broward County, Florida, and former Army Captain. Thank you, sir, for your service. And Johnny Bond, Esquire, Attorney at Law at Bond Law. Thank you, panelists. First question. Our first question. <clears throat> In several states, politicians have passed legislation erecting voting barriers, making it difficult or impossible for eligible voters, specifically African Americans, to vote. So just to get some context, we mean about barriers. There are several, but um, lack of language access, voter ID requirements, polling place closures and or consolidations, and aggressive voter poll purges. In your opinion, how do we protect voting rights and ballot access for communities of color while we navigate the barriers that impact and prevent them from voting? Anyone can go first. Yeah, I could take this one first. You know, this is something that's pretty close to me you know, as a candidate for supervisor of elections here in Florida. Uh, Florida has been at the forefront of voter suppression efforts, basically uh, innovating in that area for the whole country uh, since 1870. Uh, as soon as uh, black men had the right to vote, we had legislators in, uh, in the state of Florida that were trying to find ways to suppress the black vote. Um, and it still goes on today. In a lot of cases, they'll pass a new law um, that they know is not going to make it past the courts, um, that the courts will eventually strike down. And this goes all the way back to the infamous grandfather clause. There was never any doubt that that law would never make it, but they passed it for the temporary effects because we're worried about the next election, the next election cycle. And if we can have that law in effect and at least keep a few people from voting, then maybe we can sustain white supremacy a little bit longer. And we just have, need to be on top of that and see when these bills are moving through our state legislatures, pay attention to what's going on and make sure we're holding these folks feet to the fire as soon as it happens. Thank you. Next, Ms. Edwards. Yes, um, thank you so much. Uh, my recommendation would be to put pressure on the federal elections commission because they are the ones who provide overall guidance throughout the United States, although the states are able to make their own decisions on how elections are to go forth. But because that is not working time and time again, uh, we need to take the fight up to the national level to standardize how elections are to go forth, and particularly with this COVID-19 pandemic, where all states knew that uh, life was complicated in general and that interventions needed to have been taken place much earlier. Um, at least California was brave and California decided to automatically send ballots out to everyone, the official voter ballot out to everyone so that they could assure that they could vote as opposed to uh, methods being all over the place in the other states. Thank you. Johnny? Um, thank you, first of all, uh, for having me again. Uh, had, I, had being one of the first panelists on the first discussion, um, and then following up with the voter uh, suppression issue, uh, I've, I've, I have a unique kind of response and participation in this discussion uh, because I know what we talked about last time and I know that we've, we've gone from that to, uh, you know, as we said, beyond the protest, getting into this larger issue of voter suppression, which has always been an issue from, from, from since the end of slavery. Uh, but I think but when we had our last discussion, we thought, or well, we would hope that, you know, the protest, or we assume that the protest uh, would kind of be done by now, they fizzled out. But, you know, what has shockingly happened is that the protests haven't ended. And I think, you know, we're not quite beyond those protests. Um, and I think that's a very key point here as we start to talk about 
you know, are, are we moving beyond the protests or the protests prolonged? Because as we saw, Rashad Brooks' uh, case uh, in, in the, the height of the George Floyd protest, we have another shooting that then prompted a whole new set of protests. And I think, you know, as I wrestled with today's discussion, and you've got to forgive me a little bit here, but if, as I wrestled with today's discussion, the leap that we made from the conversation we had before to now voter suppression, uh, I, I, just re I just wrestled with it. And I, find, I was trying to figure out how to tie all this in together. And it obviously it ties in together because white supremacy and uh, racism has long been a force driving the decisions and the laws that have prevented and suppressed the black vote. Uh, but when we're talking about voting, to me, uh, it can become confused with this is the answer to your problems, Black America, and this is how you can participate in this process. And what I'd like to say is specifically, it's, it's, a, it's voting is a lifestyle. Voting is a lifestyle. It is an active, continual process. There is a phrase that is written on the side of the uh, statute. Uh, on the right side, it says, vigilance is, eternal vigilance is the price for freedom. And Frederick Douglass made this quote, stated this quote in a lot of his speeches. It's been quoted by a lot of people, but that's what is required in a democracy, in a country like ours, eternal vigilance. And for minority communities, in order to participate in this democ the U.S. democracy, it has to be clear and has to be understood that eternal vigilance is the price for freedom. So not only, you know, listen, we, in, in, in this democracy, uh, it's as well as a capitalist society, as well as as a democracy, and, and embedded in that is the concept of competition for your interest to be at the forefront of the, the political and legal agenda. And in order to participate in that process, voting has to be a lifestyle. But here's where I think we turn we we turn back to this concept of going beyond the protest. The protest is political activism as well. And I don't, and I know this is not our intent, and we're not trying to say that the protests uh, should stop and then we move on. But protests are political activism. What's happening right now with these these protests is like conversations that have never been had in a very long time, or were hushed in silence because we've made certain uh, uh, progress with the election of a black president and other progress. Uh, the concept of police brutality was almost totally ignored until the Black Lives Matter movement came along. That's the type of eternal vigilance that needs to take place and it needs to continue. And the voting as a lifestyle has to be embedded in the culture so that when, when you see your mayor who's advocating certain issues, you see, uh, in, for instance, with Joe Scott, he's running for supervisor of elections. I looked at your, your, uh, your background, Joe, I think you're an excellent candidate and your participation in this panel is part of what we're talking about. You've got to be voted in. People like you, Marlena as well, people like you have got to be voted in and this is voting as a lifestyle is what I'm, I'm saying needs to happen on the state, the local and the federal level. So I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry to throw that in there, but I wanted to kind of tell you my thoughts about what I was wrestling with and tying these two concepts together. And I believe that the political activism is just as much an important part of voting uh, during every cycle, participating, knowing what your agenda is, enforcing that agenda through the ballot. Excellent, you make some great points. Uh, we appreciate your, your uh, feedback uh, and they are connected uh, as we spoke last time, we thought prayed, hope that unfortunately the George Floyd was going to be ideally the last, but uh, we said that wasn't the case. And so uh, to your point, I never thought of it, voting is a lifestyle and so many people just don't, um, well, we'll get to that later because there's a question that pertains to that. So um, I'm gonna move on to our next question. Marlene, I would like for you to take the lead on this question. Many formerly incarcerated citizens don't know their voting status. And in some cases, they have been given incorrect information about their ability about their ability to vote, thus preventing them from exercising their rights. As far as voting rights are concerned, 
What do we have in place now to help educate our returning citizens and what are we missing? We have very little in place to educate our returning citizens and it's basically word of mouth if you encounter them. If we remember during the uh, last presidential election, uh, Pennsylvania made an effort of taking out banners and placing banners out in roadways in order to inform people who may have been ex-felons that they are able to vote. So uh, we have really failed in letting them know what their rights are and there needs to be a national effort to make sure that they know that they are able to vote or in the District of Columbia, that even if they are incarcerated, they are still able to vote. So that's only um, a push that has just started to make sure that incarcerated individuals can actually vote while they're in jail. Okay, thank you. Joe, this is a, this is your bailiwick. Yeah, so there, there's, a, there's a few things that we have to keep in mind when it comes to this particular issue around felon disenfranchisement. The first thing we all need to know is that this is not normal. Um, you take places, you take states like Florida that have very um, strict laws in place around voter disenfranchisement for, for convicted felons. That doesn't happen in democracies in other countries. It doesn't even happen everywhere in the United States. And these laws did not exist until after black men gained the right to vote in the late 1800s. So we know why these laws came into existence to begin with. In some cases, such as here in the state of Florida, we actually had a state senator who said that on the floor of the Senate, it's in the, it's in the, uh, in the record, um, that, that you know, basically they were passing this law in order to keep black people from voting. So then what else do they do? So then from there, you look at a case like Crystal Mason in Texas who was uh, somebody who had been previously incarcerated, did not realize that she didn't have the right to vote, had a family member who took her to the polls and said, hey, you need to go vote. She voted and she was prosecuted. She was sentenced to five years in prison, a mother of three, um, you know, as if because she accidentally voted when she didn't have the right to vote, she is somehow a, a uh, threat to, to society and needs to be locked away in a cage. You know, we know that's not right. Uh, we know that the, the reason that that sentence was handed down in such a heavy-handed way was to send a message to everybody else who might be uncertain or unsure about their own status. Don't risk it. Don't take a chance. Don't exercise your right to vote. It's not worth it. That's the message they want to get across. And that's what we have to counter. We have to try to counter that, and we have to go back and say, hey, we have your back. You are allowed to vote. You do have the right to vote. Um, one thing I see um, circulating here in Florida, there's a flow chart that was put out by the ACLU that basically will take you through a series of questions that you can ask to determine if you are eligible to vote or not based on you know, what your particular um, circumstances are. And um, tools like that are very important to make uh, our returning citizens feel comfortable um, with actually participating in the process because we need you to. We need you to participate, we need you to vote, we need everybody to vote. Um, and, and it takes everybody in the community to actually, um, you know, to, to encourage these folks to make sure they're doing the right thing, make sure they're making the right decision and then getting them to the polling place. We passed a constitutional amendment here in Florida two years ago to actually restore the rights for most um, um, of our returning citizens. And our um, legislature, which is dominated by Republicans, as well as our governor, have been fighting hard since we passed that constitutional amendment to basically muddy the waters and make our returning citizens feel uncomfortable. And so we have a big job to do with countering those efforts and in, in getting our folks to, to actually go out and vote. Great, thank you. So uh, just to recap, Marlena, you suggest uh, it's a national effort. And Joe, you're suggesting, um, sounds as if some states are penalizing these individuals who've already served the time for simply wanting to exercise their 
civil right, and that is just to vote, to cast their vote without being faced. And I do remember that story of the young lady in Texas, um, which was an eye opener for me. I had no clue or idea. And how would you know? So um, Johnny, I want you to wrap this up since you are our uh, resident attorney. Yep. Um, I think both Marlena and Joe hit the nail on the head. Um, and in, as, as, as uh, candidates, they are very attuned and sensitive to the, the very practical uh, issues that involved in their particular campaigns, uh, as well as in their particular locales. Um, what I find interesting, and this issue's come up a lot, uh, when I worked on the John Kerry campaign, which he lost, uh, but there was a huge issue in Ohio about, at the time, about uh, registering uh, felons and having and, and their right to vote. Uh, the issue about tying one's right to vote to uh, a criminal past is part of the same process of trying to impact the minority's votes. Uh, there is no logical connection between someone's criminal activity and their right to vote in a society that we have today. Um, you have, and then we have to look into different states, and I know that in Florida, as Jill just explained, this has been a huge battleground area for voter suppression. Uh, the link to incarceration and whether you're a felon and your ability to vote is, is, to, is, is, is clearly a, a, a residue of the past of the, 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 the attempts to disenfranchise Black Americans going all the way back to uh, abolition of slavery, then on to Reconstruction, Jim Crow era, and then the Civil Rights Movement. We're dealing with the same thing. Just recently in 2013, and where we see this resurfacing is uh, issue coming up, uh, 2013, the Supreme Court in Shelby versus Holder uh, you know, decided not to uh, require the states that had a his history of slavery to explain what their voting requirements would be. And that that decision opened up basically a floodgate of the issues that we're seeing now with the voter ID, the voter purging, the uh, incarceration issues, and the voter registration. Um, you know, th th we have to challenge this issue at the core. I believe that some of the criminalization of African Americans uh, since uh, slavery and to the current date has created this idea and we bought into some of these concepts that incarceration then should equal uh, your loss of your rights and your right to vote. Uh, but if we pay attention to the link between that and, and, and incarceration and disenfranchisement, uh, maybe we can challenge these views that we've accepted over time. And I think that's where we have to start. And, and as we are now, we see with these George Floyd uh, protest and now Rashard Brooks, conversations that have never happened are happening now. I mean, I've, I haven't seen the, the concept of uh, white supremacy and systemic racism be an issue in mass media for I don't know how long and, and with voices that are supporting it because unfortunately it takes our community these huge uh, events to bring our issues to light. Emmett Till was one of those issues. It, it, it often involves a death or a lynching or some very nonviolent movements. It, we have to show with our bodies, oftentimes, the, 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 the consequences of systemic racism. But we're talking about it now. And with this cultural shift, I believe we need to let these voices be heard. We need to pay attention to it and how it all fits into a larger conversation and then decide as human beings to address it on a real level. Um, I was just in a conversation with someone else and we talked about this last time. I mean, look, racism, I believe, is a, is a huge issue. Uh, how are we going to get rid of it? How, how can we dismantle it when there are a lot of institutions and systems built upon it or at least have benefited from it? Uh, that's a larger discussion. It's not all going to happen overnight. It's not going all, all to happen uh, probably uh, as a result of these protests, but the conversations need to continue. The issue spotting, what we do in law is issue spotting of, of systemic racism, uh, white supremacy, and how that all correlates to the issues that we're talking about today needs to continue to happen. Um, 
and we need to challenge some of our some of these 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 beliefs and thoughts that have come into our our psyches and our thought patterns challenge those that are at, at the core even within ourselves so you know I, I i think the main issue is can we ultimately challenge the concept of tying uh your right to vote uh to whether you're incarcerated whether you're felling and dismantle that completely thank you so yeah. clearly we still have work to do go ahead marlia yes i'm sorry if uh, if i may add that we have to continue to galvanize what is happening uh, with voter suppression or, or even with the protesting while we have all groups of Americans who are uh, awakened by this issue. Because if you go all over wards one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, you see Black Lives Matters signs in people's yards because it has opened up their eyes. So while we have the wind to our sail, the wind behind our backs of our sails, it needs to be galvanized into a national movement. Uh, we need to look at these, uh, what's old is new. If paper ballots is what worked before, Maybe that's what we need to look at as opposed to malfunctioning voting machines, which may have incorrect uh, algorithms. And as Johnny was saying, um, whenever voter suppression is done, it's never going to be done in the same way. When we had the issue with the hanging chads in Florida, everyone was racing to Florida, um, many attorneys to look for something to happen again with the next election, with Kerry's election in Florida, but the issues were in Ohio. So we could never look for things to happen the same way twice. We need to be preemptive in how we deal holistically with this voter suppression issue. Absolutely, I agree with, uh, with everything uh, each of you have uh, stated. So clearly there's uh, work to be done um, in this area. And uh, as you suggest, Marlena, how do we get this on a national front? Um, and Johnny, to your point, we have, you know, we have the movement, let's use it uh, to our advantage. And there's, it's a huge issue. We could probably do an entire topic right. about this. <laughs> right. right, we could not pack that by itself, right? Oh, absolutely. But, but for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, move on to our next question. Um, Johnny, I'm gonna let you take the lead on this since as our resident attorney. Um, there is a growing concern that trans transgender voters will be disenfranchised in encounter discrimination due to photo ID laws, which require voters to present photo ID that matches their name. A 2018 study found that photo ID laws had the potential to inhibit the right to vote for more than 78,000 transgender people in eight states and serves as a significant detriment to voting participation. participation. Uh, according to the movement advancement projects, several states have unclear or burdensome requirements such as court order, proof of surgery, or unamended birth certificate to change a person's driver's license to accurately reflect their gender identity. How can we hold state and federal lawmakers accountable to protect the rights of our trans brothers and sisters? Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, this is a very important issue. Um, and, 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 Unfortunately, you know, the right of everyone uh, is, is not does not always come into focus. But I believe that it it should always be uh, at the top of the list to ensure that everyone has the right to vote. I look at any attempt to prevent someone a vote to vote uh, from voting, rather uh, based on any issues like that as just more of the same of the disenfranchisement, you would see a clear connection between, and, 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 and look, let, we have to be a little bit more clear about th this, th these conversations because we, when we talk about the national, the federal level, we can, the federal level can, enforce, can provide the laws and then enforce them. But on, the, on voting day, that's when it counts. So what has to happen is it, everything needs to happen on the local level. 
Um, w w there are certain states that would obviously want to identify uh, trans or uh, gender voters uh, because they may feel that they would have uh, more, uh, they would vote a certain way based on uh, certain social cues. Uh, maybe in the southern states, more conservative states, that's where we'd have to get involved on those local levels uh, to participate. Obviously, the federal uh, level can make sure that our laws say that they have the right to vote. But uh, the issue, as was stated in the Shelby v. Holder situation, is that the states have the rights and the local municipalities have the rights to dictate how they enact and enforce their voting. And that's where, as you said, the voter ID issues come into play. Uh, this is going to take a huge level of effort on the, at the local level. Uh, obviously, uh, the parties, the, the political parties, the Democrats, uh, their organization efforts need to be cued or cl closely attuned to uh, making sure that everyone has a right to vote. That means dropping lit or giving uh, information and talking points as to what needs to be what needs to be said when they're in line, when they're attempting to vote, prior to voting, early voting. Uh, it's a massive effort, and, and I can't help but go back to what I'm saying. Listen, what I said earlier, voting is a lifestyle. It's a constant, e eternal battle to, vote, to, to maintain your right to vote, to enforce it, and then to actually vote in the candidates, support the, the, the people that uh, support your, your interests and your agendas. Um, so once we get down to the local level, you've got to have a lot more local, uh, local organization and advocacy that happens, uh, that, 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 that resolves the issue on the, on election day and around election day. I'll, I'll go ahead and go next. Um, you know, I think the situation is probably different in uh, different parts of the country, but I can tell you, you know, for us here in Florida, I think we are uh, a ways away from at a point where those laws are going to change here in Florida, um, because what it'll take first is to change uh, the makeup of our state legislature in order to um, in order to be able to get the right kind of um, the, the, the changes that we need to the laws in order to make our, our, um, our system more inclusive, because it's certainly a problem um, that, that we're not as inclusive as we could be now. So the question being for somebody like myself, who's a local official, is how can I work within the, um, you know, without, with it, while I have to comply with the laws that are on the books, what can I do around just having discussions and, you know, meeting with activist groups within the LGBTQ community and having these discussions and letting them know, making sure that they're educated on what the law requires in order for them to be able to vote. And just, and in some cases, I would say, I would just be open to having that discussion with them about what would you like to see me do, knowing that these are my constraints. You know, this is my, these are the limits that I have to operate in. What do you feel like I can do as your supervisor of elections to make the process more inclusive for you? And that's exactly the type of thing that I would do to sit down with, with any group of people who feel like the system isn't working for them and find out what I can do within the confines of, of, of where the law is today and, um, and do what I can to make them feel more comfortable, at least make sure that they're educated on what the requirements are so that they show up to the polling place in a way that's going to allow them to actually exercise their right to vote, if they choose to. Excellent. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? Um, yes, I have actually worked with an individual who was fortunate enough to use the law so that they could have their actual birth certificate changed to reflect their gender their present gender identity but the issue is dealing with the individual states or places where they may attempt to go where um, tra the transgender community may attempt to go and vote 
and we need to make sure that individuals at the Board of Elections or the actual voting day are familiar with what the laws are and that the transgender community is educated to know that they can even go ahead and cast, be allowed to cast a special ballot, which could possibly, while things are being straightened out uh, for that election and which can often come into play in deciding an election. Okay. Thank you all for your, uh, for your uh, input. Uh, next question. Currently, we are in the middle of a global pandemic and a major racial un injustice movement in the United States. Many people in communities of color are experiencing a range of emotions, sadness, anger, frustration, hopelessness, mental and emotional exhaustion. And they feel, often feel as though the system is rigged against them and that their vote will not count or will make any difference. With Jim Crow era tactics leaving lasting pain and trauma resonating through black communities, the relationship between most African-Americans and their trust in the voting system remains non-existent. How can we increase voter participation, change voter mindset, and restore their faith in the voting process while we work to fix this? Joe, I'm gonna let you take the lead on this one. Sure. So I would say that throughout the history you know, of the past 150 years now, we've been fighting this battle. We've taken huge steps forward only to experience a backlash and, and, and see our, our rights start to degrade. Um, you know, th so that has happened over and over again over the course of the last 150 years. And as uh, Mr. Bond brought up earlier, we did have a major setback that took place in 2013 with that Supreme Court decision of Shelby versus Holder. And we have since then seen this um, revival of voter suppression tactics um, that are new. I mean, it's new because they're not using the same, they're not doing the same things they did 50 years ago and 100 years ago. This is, it's, it's updated for the 21st century. And our tactics to resist and to fight back need to be updated for the 21st century. We will have our, our, next, victory. our next victory is coming. And, um, and when we're starting the process now of organizing, of getting those ideas, of doing all the work that has to be done in order to in order to to get that next big victory that's going to get us one step closer uh, to ultimate equality, and you know, and I, I would say that people who are discouraged and feel like they just want to drop out of the process, you're looking at it the wrong way. We're we're closer to victory than we've ever been before, and this is the time for us to double down and work harder because we're almost there. And we just have to get to the finish line. Excellent. Thank you. Johnny? Um, yeah, thank, you know, thank you again, uh, BAU, putting this panel together and, 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 and probing into the questions that we're probing into. There's so, uh, so many things to talk about. So many things go through my mind when we talk about this issue. One is the, the responsibility that is laid upon the, the individual voter to see voting as a lifestyle, engage themselves, identify their interests and understand what system, you know, what philosophical and uh, legal and economic framework this country is consist of and how to actually navigate that uh, for your benefit. Um, and then there's also a, a larger question that comes up uh, to me about just the, the very mechanics of uh, the U.S. And, that, and what I mean by that is we clearly know that the, 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 the Constitution says that every man is created equal, yet we've had to have a civil right, we, we had to abolish slavery, and then we had to have a Civil Rights Act of 1866 to say, oh yeah, everybody is created equal. And, and, and that includes you know, African Americans. And then we've had to go on to different iterations and as you look at that, this timeline and this progression that, that Joe talked about, uh, you know, you see this constant, uh, this constant movement to be recognized as equal, to be treated as equal, and to uh, be allowed to participate 
at the same time, you know, we, we, we have to look at this, this dynamic between uh, the population of the U.S. The, the minority population is growing, and we can and we can see with the election of President Trump that uh, the, the the issues of minorities uh, and others coming into the U.S. and impacting others' rights. It, it turns out that one one part one person's advancement is is seen as a threat to another's. Uh, how do we get past that? Uh, that that dynamic, I don't know. I mean, we as human beings, we have that issue of uh, seeing others as a threat. That's just somewhere in our biological DNA code, evolutionary. Possibly, we have to confront that. Um, but listen, I mean, w w when we try to take tackle this issue, we we have to say what what will happen as a result of our movements forward. We can anticipate that there will be backlash. We can anticipate that. The constant advancement of one, our group or other groups of minorities uh, will be seen as a threat. Um, and when you take that into consideration and you, you build that into your, 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 your process of understanding that that may and will happen in this, this environment, you have to stay vigilant and, and understand that you know, we'll have to confront these issues time and time again as long as that is a problem. And I think it will continue to be one. I don't like wearing rosy colored glasses in, in any given situation. As a lawyer, I'm trained to think through my adversary's next move, uh, their arguments, their positions, and that there may be a third party who will agree or disagree with them or agree and disagree with me. Um, look, the, the, the laws of the U.S. is the battleground. That's where we have the ability to shape and mold our destiny. Um, and be, participating in that process requires organization, political advocacy. It requires to, to adopting the, the concept of voting is a lifestyle and watch every vote, not just the presidential elections. Watch your state legislature, as Joe just said. You've got to be very involved in that. And how do how do you get involved in that if you believe that the system is rigged and, and, and it doesn't work for you? I don't know how to answer that question. But I know that we've got, you know, it, 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 if, if it comes down to, you know, unfortunate circumstances of George Floyd's death and, and now uh, and many others before bringing this issue to light, Allow this moment, take this moment to say to yourself and to others, we have to be involved every day as a lifestyle. What do I need? A lot of minority groups often are struggling because they don't have enough income and they're, they're, you know, their issues are, I need to eat. I need to you know, feed my child. And they, they can't see beyond that. So I can understand where uh, the political, this conversation may fall on deaf ears when it's like, well, look, I need to pay attention to my child and my, my, my stomach and I need to pay rent. I can't really think too much more about any of the issues. That is a, that is a real concern. It's a real issue. Um, engaging uh, different groups of the socioeconomic stratus of our, of our, of our citizenry in, in terms of you know, in uh, bringing, getting people to to take play that part of voting and paying attention to the issues is a very complicated process. It's a very complicated, multifaceted issue. Um, I think paying attention to the whole of it is very important. Engaging advocacy groups uh, around every specific part of it is important. Um, and, and I don't think that you know, it's the easy answer for either of us because there's so many different layers to, to, the, to, the, to the issue and to the, the, the body politic. But I will say uh, moments like these are very critical times uh, and, and can be a, a, a flashpoint for us to engage these conversations and to keep people informed. I also would like to say, I think, you know, the advancement of technology has allowed uh, for dissemination of information uh, in a way that has never happened before. 
I don't think we'd be here if it weren't for Twitter, Facebook, and a lot of the social media where a lot of information can spread around the world quickly. That is a, 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 fo a, a point that I think we should pay attention to and harness and use that as we go forward. Uh, but also take a view that, you know, I, I think what we're seeing now is that we're not all pessimistic. We're not all believing that the system is rigged. I mean, we've had some advancements. I just believe that we've got to keep looking at the issue. Like the, 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 the threat, the perception of a threat of your, your personhood and your advancement in, in society as a threat is not going to go away. There will, it will manifest itself, like Marlena said earlier, it will manifest itself in different forms and different venues and different levels. Um, accept it. Make it part of your lifestyle. But understand, the laws, is, that's the battleground. And that's where we have to be involved. And voting is one way to do it. Uh, talking to your, 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 your representatives. But I think it all starts, and I'm, I'm kind of jumping around here, and I apologize, but it starts with having your own agenda. We have to have our own agendas as well and, and enforce those and, and, and move them into the conversation and move them into uh, in, in on, onto the uh, legislative front. Um, so sorry for kind of being all around on that, but that's where I think that, you know, we've got to uh, look at it from a holistic standpoint. No, that's fine. No need, no need to apologize. Uh, once again, this is another topic that we can we can unpack um, in a series that ended up to itself. So uh, we only have an hour, so we're trying to, uh, I, I have the honor of being with three esteemed professionals who are very uh, passionate about the work that you do in your community. So I don't expect this to, you know, we can tie it up and put a bow on it. And like, okay, great, we'll move on. I do, however, really like, and I hope the participants, the audience, um, lifestyle, you know, voting is a lifestyle. I never thought of it in that, in that, uh, in that term. So, Hopefully we can gain some momentum. Um, once again, the Black Lives Matter, uh, whatever the protesting, people working in the local communities, um, those are, that is truly, where does that start? Um, and that's a rhetorical question, but who takes the lead on that? Um, and Johnny, I think to your point, it can literally just start um, with your family. Uh, I'm sure we all have older relatives that don't vote because they do remember, you know, what happened in the South, you know, with the dogs and the water hoses. Um, or they just really don't feel their uh, their vote will make a difference. I, in preparing for today's uh, topic, I came across some research that suggested that when Obama was um, running for president, that there was a spike, obviously, in people who were registered votes. That in turn, some states implemented some of these barriers and these laws that prevented the exact same thing. So Johnny, to your point, you were perceived as a threat. So we're going to figure out some way, some loophole, so that your vote doesn't count. And then we're almost like back at square one. And I think that's sometimes where folks, um, people uh, become a little frustrated and challenged and, and they experience a range of feelings and emotions with regard. I do have a question, um, and being mindful of the time. Uh, I have a question. So I'm, technology, here's the question. There were so many different problems in Georgia, like last minute change of voting uh, places, ballots in specific neighborhoods, what can we do to prevent this to prevent this from happening in November? Can you repeat the question? Absolutely. So basically, the question is, what we saw happen in Georgia with the uh, 2020 primary just a few weeks ago, how can we prevent those same actions not to happen um, as we move into the presidential election in November? Um, if I may take that one. Absolutely. That went off. Um, we have less than six months until November. And the only way that we can deal with that is holding our present board of election officials accountable for how they're gonna roll out the November election. And it needs to be done within the timeline of a month. And uh, that's it because often a lot of information has been fluid, it continually changes, and people are not uh, finding out information or they are creatures of habit. Um, more specifically, uh, if Board of Elections in the District of Columbia could only open up two to three centers in each ward because of the COVID-19 
And in my conversation with them, they said that placards would be placed at all of the regular voting centers, and that did not happen. That's an issue. Or even uh, opening up non-regular voting centers as new COVID-19 COVID centers where people are not familiar with it. That's uh, another issue. Um, education, making sure and getting the information out to people early because I believe that everyone was more concerned with national news, what was happening with COVID-19, what was mm -hmm. happening with the death of George Floyd and others and uh, protesters and just assumed that they could go to the regular voter set, voting center and vote. So uh, we need to make sure that uh, guidelines are laid out immediately within the, the, the next month, that's it, so that people can have an understanding of what needs to be done. And then in terms of voter education, if we look at the District of Columbia, we have in excess of 400,000 individuals who are registered to vote, but only a little over 100,000 people vote. So I would um, like for Mr. Bond and Mr. Scott to weigh in on that, that what is the disconnect if we say that we are outraged by the voter suppression. We're outraged uh, by uh, by the death, unfortunate deaths of these individuals by the hands of the law. People need to go and vote, but only a fourth of the people go and vote anyway. So, so how do we deal with that in our local jurisdictions? or nationwide and pulling in the advocacy groups to make people realize this is serious and don't wait until the last minute. During early voting, the voting stations are basically empty. The election day, everyone waits to the last minutes. It's packed. Voting went until after 1 a.m. at one station the next morning and so many people walked out the line couldn't vote or couldn't even turn in their absentee ballots at, their, at the uh, temporary voting stations. So I would also like uh, for the others to weigh in on that. Sure. Uh, Joe, if you, you want to do uh, Sure, yeah. So I'll tell you, this is definitely a big fight for us here in Florida. I think the first step, um, it's already the case in Florida, but for Georgia, you need to go to hand marked paper ballots. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that we are still in the very early days of, uh, of a new paradigm where cybersecurity is, is a major factor in our, in our national security as a whole. And this, it will be this way for forever. It's not going to change. For the foreseeable future, we need hand-marked paper ballots because that's an unhackable uh, system that we can go back to if we find out that something else has gone wrong with our elections. Now, there could be other problems because we still need some, we're still gonna need technology to maintain our voter rolls and to tabulate all the votes um, in a timely manner. And there could be problems there that cause delays in the process as well. And, you know, so, so really what it is is that we need elections officials who have a different competency than what we've looked for in the past. Um, in, in the past, I think we've often brought people to be elections officials or to be in charge of our elections who maybe had a long background in politics or people that we feel like know a lot about elections. But, you know, the, the political parties are always going to have their attorneys to sit there and argue the issues and go to court and try to get, um, you know, get changes made at the last second to account for any sort of um, circumstances that come up at the last minute. But what we need in our elections officials are people who are proficient at getting a, a complicated job done or getting a difficult job done. People who understand the technology and the systems that they have to deal with. That's who our election officials need to be. Not necessarily partisan political figures, but people who understand those systems, who understand that technology and can keep the operation moving on election day. Um, and, and if we can do those, I think if we do those two things, if we get every jurisdiction in the country to have hand-marked paper ballots, 
And if we get every jurisdiction in the country to focus on getting people into their elections operations who understand technology, then we will have, um, you know, the, a lot of these problems will, will start to melt away. Thank you. Johnny? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to leave the discussion about election uh, technology to the experts. Uh, that is not my area. Um, I am a voter like everyone else. And, you know, I, that's about as much as I pay attention to it. So whether there's one technology that's better and we need to go back to paper ballots, I can't speak to it. I'd love to be more informed about it. So thank you, Joe for, and, and Marlena, for bringing these things to my attention. What I can talk about fr from my experience, though, in terms of uh, getting people out to vote and, and the issues around actually voting on voting day comes from my experience in working in politics on some, some local campaigns in Nashville, Tennessee, as well as the federal campaigns. Um, it, there, had, there, there, is a, there is an approach that I've witnessed, and, and, I'm, and I'm a critic of, 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 of a lot of things. Um, and one of them is the, the approach to uh, what is called, what's referred to as GOTV, get out the vote. I think we, everyone knows what, what, what we're talking about here. Um, there's, a, there's an approach that works in, in different areas, works better than others. I think uh, for a long time, uh, the federal level uh, campaign operated apparatus has largely seen that the black vote or African Americans come out to vote later in the process. And, and there's a lot of effort and money that's put into actually getting them to the polls getting them registered and that type of thing. Um, what, what I noticed about the Obama campaign was that they started with the grassroots community uh, effort. And it did not have a hierarchy that I saw with some of the previous campaigns. Uh, and I think that that is a recipe for success when engaging the community long before voting day and long before the last two weeks leading up to it. Um, that system to me is old and it does not work and it does not encourage involvement in the actual process. Um, I wouldn't say that it, it, it takes the, 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 the a, a certain population's vote for granted. Uh, I would just say that it probably could be uh, improved such that people feel like they have a stake in the process. Uh, and how we do that, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's great when you can get funding and, and encourage people to get involved, but volunteerism is a huge thing that we often underestimate. And I believe, you know, I, I think that uh, the Obama, uh, their campaign uh, machine actually harnessed the power of volunteerism. And let me explain, like, what I've seen in my, pro in, in my experience from volunteerism and how it can affect the polls, at least, at least in GLTV and on, 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 on election day. Um, trial, I, I belong to a, a group of esteemed professionals known as trial attorneys, and we catch a lot of flack uh, in, in this country, but I will tell you being a part and among them has been an honor because I have seen true advocacy on the, uh, on the behalf of individuals who've been harmed and victimized as a part of this, this, this system that we live in, and they've championed a lot of causes. And what a lot of the trial attorneys do is they early vote and then they go volunteer at the polls. This could happen on a volunteer level as, as voters, if they vote early, they can then go stand outside of the polls, they can encourage people to stay in lines, they can be involved at that level. Not only asking people to vote, but asking them to volunteer their time to make sure that everyone votes, and specifically in Georgia. I mean, we have an issue right now dealing with COVID and wearing masks and having to be afraid of your own health standing in a line uh, to vote uh, for hours, obviously is going to frustrate that process. But if we could think through the, 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 the ability to harness volunteerism, for people to socially distance themselves, as well as encourage other people to stand in line, to, to, to give them umbrellas if it's raining, uh, ponchos if it's raining. Uh, those are the efforts, these are the things that we can, we can use ourselves, we can use our, our time and our energy to do that. 
in encouraging and getting people excited to be involved at that level, I think we have a model. Obama's, their campaign apparatus harnessed that very well. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be excited to see if uh, uh, the, Bi the Biden campaign does that. Um, I think that they should, um, but I mean, we can also do it on a local level. Uh, so that's, that's kind of like my two cents on that. Um, igniting community involvement at a grassroots level is something that I think we need to look back as to why that was successful for the Obama, Obama campaign and, and utilize that at every level, uh, local, state, uh, every level of, 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 of the uh, political process. Thank you. And that is your, your uh, input is worth more than two cents in my book. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is three o'clock. Um, I have so many questions, and this has been a great, robust conversation. Uh, I think our audience participants are just in awe, taking in uh, uh, everything you, you all have made extremely valid points. Uh, a couple of takeaways, um, volunteerism, as you suggested, Johnny, uh, voting is a lifestyle, education, uh, how do we get people in engaged? And this is really, I feel, just the beginning of, of this discussion. We have probably barely scratched the surface. There's just so, so much work um, that we can do. Um, once again, just starting in our own networks, our personal and professional uh, networks. You know, how do they feel about voting? Are they registered votes? Uh, to Marlena's uh, uh, comment, if there are 400,000 people in the District of Columbia to vote and only 100,000 people are voting, that's a problem. I vote and I register. I should talk to my friends. But <laughs> just to let you know, um, we do appreciate this. So I just want to close out uh, real quick. With, um, with this, this is my final thoughts. We need to combat voter suppression through advocacy, grassroots efforts, legal action, and public education. Thank you for your participation today. Uh, discussion about voter suppression is our goal that you leave armed with facts and details that lend to an ongoing discussion, but change and action is where we begin to move the needle. Thank you all for participating, and I'm sure we will continue this discussion. Have everyone have a great and safe weekend, and happy Juneteenth. All right, happy Juneteenth. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.